I'd like to do a, an assessment of the anti-colonial ideology espoused by Barack Obama Sr. and infused as a defining characteristic in his son, uh, Barack Obama. And this this um, anti-colonialism is essentially a strategy of reducing America's wealth and power. That, I believe, was the consistent Obama agenda over his eight years. That, I believe, is the driving force behind the Biden administration, guided by Obama's invisible hand now. Uh, in 1965, Obama's father, uh, Barack Obama Sr., published a paper in the East African Journal which was called Problems Facing Our Socialism. Uh, being an economist, he was discussing tax rates. Uh, and he talked about uh, his proposal, kind of a new idea, for a tax rate that he thought would be uh, really a, a good reflection of socialist principles in action. Uh, what was the tax rate that Barack Obama Sr. wanted uh, for industry? Uh, answer, 100%. A 100% tax rate. In other words, um, you start a business, you make a profit, and you turn all of it uh, into the government. I'm not quoting him. He goes, theoretically, there's nothing that can stop the government from taxing 100% of income so long as the people get benefits from the government commensurate with that income which is taxed. So what he's saying is take people's money uh, and then have an entitlement state that offers people benefits with that money. That's, this is pure socialism in action. Now, when I went to, um, to Kenya, I tracked down o Obama's uh, brother. This is George Obama, his, his, um, his father's son, but f from a different wife. And uh, George Obama is not like either uh, Barack Obama uh, or uh, Barack Obama Sr. Here's a short clip of my conversation with George Obama. Listen. Recently, President Obama spoke and he was quoting from the famous um, um, story uh, of Cain and Abel, uh, that we are brother's keeper. Now, my point is, you are his brother. Has he been your keeper? Go ask him. You can almost, you know, hear the, the bitterness in George's voice. He's basically saying, you know, confirming that Obama is a massive hypocrite, a guy who talks about being, oh, we've got to be our brother's keeper. But uh, when it comes to his own brother, he's not going to lift a finger to help. Um, and this is, this is Obama's um, history. He hasn't lifted a finger to help. Many of his other family members, by the way, have been in serious trouble. They know they can't count on Obama. But in my interview with George, he goes on to say some very interesting things about colonialism. First of all, he says that he doesn't blame the poverty of Kenya on the British. Why not? I'm going to quote him. He says that at the time of Kenya's independence in the early 1960s, he goes, quote, Kenya was on, was on an economic par with Malaysia or Singapore. We were at the same level in terms of development. Look where we are now and where they are. They're practically developed and industrialized while Kenya is still a basket case. Now, if you think about this, this is extremely crushing because what George is saying, he's an intelligent guy, uh, is that, look, all these three countries were under Western domination in one form or another. All of them got independence about the same time. How is it the case that the so-called Asian tigers are three, four, five times as wealthy as Kenya? How can we blame that on the British? We started off at the same place, uh, but we, we've ended up very differently. It, uh, it looks like the poverty, the misery, the corruption in Kenya is the fault of the people running Kenya ever since then. So this is George, and I believe that this is part of the reason why Obama, this is Barack Obama Jr., the son, hates him. The reason Obama won't help him isn't just because Obama is a cheapskate and Obama is a hypocrite, that's all true, but it's also because Obama sees George as betraying the noble father, as, as breaking with their father's ideology, as blaming the problems of Kenya on Kenyans and on the post-independence um, betrayal you may say, uh, of the freedom struggle in Kenya. Uh, now, for uh, when we think of anti-colonialism, and I've had to think about this quite a bit because, of course, I'm a product of British colonialism. 
I published an article. Um, this was in the Chronicle of Higher Education, but also in the San Francisco Chronicle. Uh, and you can look it up. It's called Two Cheers for Colonialism, in which I look at the three premises of um, the anti-colonialists uh, and show that all the three premises are wrong. So here are the three premises. Number one, colonialism and imperialism are distinctly Western. And I go, what? That's ridiculous. If you look at India alone, in, long before the British came to India, India was invaded by the Persians, by the Mongols, by the Turks, by the Afghans, by Alexander the Great, by the Arabs. So the British were like the seventh colonial power to show up uh, in India. And of course, we talk about the, uh, the Western Empire, but there was the Egyptian Empire, the Persian Empire, the Macedonian Empire, the Islamic Empire, the Mongol Empire, and so on. So when you think about the um, people say, well, we got to we got to have reparations for the crimes of Western civilization. The question becomes, what about all these other empires that have um, stormed across the um, Central Asia the, uh, and have, have dominated countries through human history? The, uh, the second premise of anti-colonialism is the West became rich through colonial oppression. Uh, and uh, this is a point that has been echoed by so many leftists, one after the other. They talk, oh, here's Franz Fanon, for example. He says, uh, the well-being and progress of Europe has been built with the sweat and dead bodies of Negroes, Arabs, Indians, and the yellow races. But in fact, the wealth of the West was built up by the Renaissance and the Reformation and the Scientific Revolution and the Enlightenment and the Industrial Revolution. And in other words, it was the inner dynamism of Western civilization. People say, well, well, didn't the West conquer all these other peoples? Yeah, but how did the West get the strength to do that? How is it that the West, take a small country like Britain, a tiny island occupying a very few square inches of real estate on, the, on a map, how was Britain able to dominate 60% of the globe? Well, it was able to do it because it had this strength driven by the Industrial Revolution that ultimately created uh, military uh, superiority. It was the West's invention of institutions like science and capitalism that produced not only the innovations, but also the economic dynamism of the West. And of course, the third and critical point is are the descendants of colonialism, which is to say people like me and Barack Obama, better or worse off as a result of it? And here I can only answer for myself, but my answer is pretty de decisive. And that is that although colonialism was in some ways bad for my ancestors, why? Because it was humiliating. They were living under the British subjugation. I recognize all that. But in what sense has colonialism been bad for me? I mean, first of all, it introduced me to the English language, which has been my whole career. I wouldn't have been able to write any of my books, make any of my movies uh, if I couldn't speak English. Uh, number two, the British not only built a whole bunch of infrastructure that India has now taken advantage of, the British started, for example, to the kind of technological education that's now put Indians in the front of the world. Um, Gandhi said that, um, that um, he had a dream of wiping a tear off every Indian face. Well, it's the the technological development of India that is doing that. Not to mention the British introduction of ideas like freedom and dignity and self-government uh, and the British courts of law that are continued by the Indians long after the British left. What I'm getting at is that colonialism was the transmission belt that brought Western civilization to Asia, Africa, and South America. And so the legacy of colonialism is not entirely bad. There are bad elements of it, but there are also good elements that have got to be balanced against it. By and large, if you look around the world, the countries today that are worse off, the people who are the poorest, the people who are living in the most primitive conditions in the, in the rainforests of the Amazon, in the faraway tribes of Asia and so on, those are the people least exposed to Western civilization. And if you look at the countries that have imbibed Western influence, Japan, the Asian tigers, now increasingly China, India, those are the countries that are growing the fastest, that have the most, that are moving more quickly toward the West and even surpassing the West, in many cases in education, in innovation and in development. Bottom line, I can't give three cheers for colonialism because I remember the tears that it extracted from my ancestors, but I'm happy to give two cheers for colonialism.